And that's a, that's a very, very dangerous position to be in, is when you're getting advice from the world. And so we don't want that to happen. So the more that you know of the Bible, the more confident that you can be in your decision making. And in order for that to happen, you need to be spending time in the Word each and every day. And so let the message today, let that go into your head, let that flow down into your heart, and because of this, your lives are different. Your actions, the things that you do with your hand, it's going to be different. And so I want you to apply today's message. Do not waste the Word of God when you read the Bible. Seek to apply it. And so today's message, let us do something with it instead of, wow, that was a nice sermon. But how can we apply God's word into our life so that we can be transformed into becoming better Christians? So today, uh, today we're going to be talking about how we as parents can love our kids. And so if you don't have any kids yet, then I would say... You treasure the words today, hold on to them, let it grow in your heart, so that one day when you find that soulmate of yours, then you can avoid all the issues that us parents have gone through. Okay? All right, so today I'm blessing you guys with two comics. This first one Before I tell you what happened, Mom, remember the Lord will never give you more than you can handle. <laughs> Has anybody ever heard that from your kids, maybe? Yeah. Okay. All right, so that's a new one. So if your parents are here, I guess you can try to pull that one off and see how that goes at your house. Okay? And then the second one. Before we go inside, repeat after me. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Okay? All right? Okay? So if, if, if we've got God in our heart, that's all we ever need. We don't need nothing else. You don't need your toys, okay? All right, so anyways, our sermon series for this entire month, it's been How to Love. And so today is part three of uh, four. And so today's message, it goes something like this. Presence, not presence. So there's a difference. This presence is you being there, not the other presence, a gift, something that you're giving. So that's going to be what we're going to be talking about today. And so, how do I love my children? That's often a question that we ask a lot is, how is it that we as parents can show love and affection towards our kids? How do we let them know that we love them. So maybe I'm not the only one to have ever asked that question. How is it that we can love our children? So then, today, if there's only one thing that I want you guys to walk away and remember, just one thing, it's really simple. Love your children by giving them your time. So if you love your kids, you give them your time. So to get us started here today, I wanted to kind of ask this question. Share with us your greatest memory of your parents. I want to be really sensitive uh, to everybody in this room. And so the reason why I say this is because, you know, like I guess traditionally we think of parents as, you know, you grew up with a mom and dad. But I also want to be really cognizant that there are some folks in this room where really they just kind of grew up with mom taking care of them or dad taking care of them. Some of them don't even have mom and dad. They just might, might have had a guardian. And so think about that kind of that mother figure, that, that fatherly figure in your life, okay? Share with us your greatest memory that you remember. What do you guys got? Okay, me. I remember when I was a kid, my dad would take I hope I'm fishing. Okay, all right. So you still treasure those memories. Others, same. Uh, I remember when uh, the first time I went to a water park, which was Rainbow Falls, but we looked at it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, my, my parents finally took mm -hmm. us to go there and awesome. fly us. It was my first time being at a boat park. Okay, cool. So Rainbow Falls. 
That's old school. Okay. All right, brother Luke. Um, when we were kids, we would always go on our vacation. We were going to a hotel and swimming. Okay. All right. Okay. So the little family getaway, even just to a hotel. Sister Peggy. My dad had a skinny snowmobile, and they had. Um, Mom and Dad had sleds that went behind him. There's eight kids in my family, so we pack up the thin sides of the sleds with uh, hamburger packs, and we you know, pile the kids on the sleds, and you know we go and we start a fire and make the hamburger packs, and it's just it was a great family time, especially shoving the sisters off the sled. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Other Scott. We used to take. Uh, I have two sisters, and we would take uh, family vacation in the uh, station wagon when I was old. Wooden panel station wagons. Mm -hmm. And we go down. We drive from. We used to drive from Minneapolis all the way down to Orlando. And Dad would just get in the car and just go through. And he put sleeping bags down on the back and pile the you know luggage up on top of the car. Uh -huh. I don't know how we did that. <laughs> <laughs> Made it work, though, right? We did. Okay. Anybody else that would like to share? Okay, Michael. I always like going to uh, the zoo with my mom and uh, family. Okay. All right, so the Zoom. Mm -hmm. Brother Dave. Something I've learned to appreciate more now as I'm older. My mother struggled with the sport. Okay. Worked two and a half, three jobs. Mm -hmm. But she always had money to buy me books. <clears throat> we go out to eat maybe once a week and have okay. special. All right. She always so she didn't have a lot, but she made time to spend that with you guys. Okay. Sister Macy. I just, my greatest memory is just them being there, you know, at my various events. And, mm -hmm. and um, you know, I just remember one time when they, they couldn't make it, and I was devastated. And okay. so, so they especially since then, at, from that point on, they, they especially made it just to be there. Sure. Mm -hmm. Just the physical presence. Mm -hmm. Okay, Brother Day. Brother uh, Christian. <laughs> great chance uh, with uh, What's the memory going to Disney World with my, both my parents and my kids? So it was really being you know, a kid and myself, so it was awesome. Okay, that's great. Florida. You still remember that, Florida. right? That is the Yang family plan for 2019. <laughs> 2019. So I told them, we got to stop giving you guys little cute toys here and there. We got to start saving all that money for this big thing so slow wikis all right yeah. awesome okay anybody else sister laura um i just remember taking um with my dad a lot he used to let me go with them on my like if you went to play okay i'd watch him work and um like learn things from him and, and then i remember my mom being a really hard worker and she always had time for us so when if we were sick she'd get up in the middle of the night mm -hmm. and take care of Sure. All right. Thank you. Okay. All right. Yeah. So I'll, this is my memories. <laughs> so I grew up really, really poor. Um, at one point, there was nine of us living in an upstairs two-bedroom apartment. And so, you know, I was never homeless, but, like, I understand poverty. And that's, that's the reason why my heart today really goes out to, you know, those that are really just struggling in this community. But, anybody know where this picture was taken? Yes, okay. So I grew up, I grew up by KFC, by the Marjan Hotel, or the Marjan Motel. Okay, so that was the Marjan over there. This is me, just, you know, a few years after we came to America. You can definitely tell that it's an old vehicle by the old car, so all you automotive folks, I don't know. So anyways, so this is the house that we lived in. It's that blue house, and that was Grace United, okay? And so they had a huge parking lot. And so I loved playing football when I was younger. And so I remember my dad and I, we would just go to that parking lot and we would just throw this football. I don't have a whole lot of memories of what my father and I did, 
But this is the one memory that stands out the most, is we just went out there, and my father would just throw me the football, and I would just catch. And you see the really cool thing about just this memory is that it's free. It didn't cost us anything to just spend that time with our family. And so this is a picture of my father. This is back in the days a little bit when he was uh, much more healthier. Again, he lives in Oklahoma now. Kennedy was just born at the time. Mm -hmm. And so that's, you know, that's one of the memories that I treasure about my father was just, you know, just us throwing the football. So what did all these memories about our parents have in common? There was one thing that every person that just spoke here, there was something that we all had in common. Sure. That was just it. It was just time. Notice how nobody in this room said, the memory that I treasure the most was that one time my dad went to the store and he got me that one thing that I wanted. Nobody said that. But yet, today, sometimes our expression of love is something that we can buy and give to our kids. But notice in all of our stories, in all of that, nobody said, man, my greatest time was when my mom gave me that thing or my dad gave me that thing. No. Our greatest memories was when our parents just gave us time to spend with them. That's all that we wanted. Okay? So it is time. So this week, we heard about the tragedy that happened down in Florida. And so I, I'm still trying to wrap my head around this incident, this tragedy. Obviously, you guys all know Monday through Friday, I work in the school district. And so when things like this happen, um, you know, it affects us educators a little bit more because even when I first started teaching, the school environment was much more different. Today, you can't even walk into a building without getting buzzed in or having a really good reason to, okay? We live in a very scary world where before we know it, there's gonna be security everywhere. Whether that's good or bad, you know, you can be the judge of that. But we live in scary times today with scary people who we just don't know what's gonna be happening. So that was Nicholas Cruz, uh, Cruz, 19 years old. He was expelled from his high school in Florida. And so this last Wednesday, February 14th, he went and he basically shot up uh, 17 people. They died, many more injured. The classmates described him as a loner with a temper and he was an outcast. What's really interesting about Nicholas though, is that he was an orphan teenager whose mother died last year, November 2017, and his father passed away years before. You know, that's kind of a recipe for kids to turn out not in the most positive light. After the death of both parents, he went to live with a family friend. So there's lots of things that we can say, well, you know, like, why did he do that? And so I hope that in the future, maybe he'll speak out more as to why he did all these things. But I find it very interesting that Nicholas Cruz, when you look at the stability of his home life, he didn't have that stability. Mom was dead, dad was already dead. He was just living with people that he knew. And working in the education system, it's a repeated pattern that a lot of times, the students that I deal with are the ones where you go home and their home life, it's a lot <coughs> of like dysfunctional. Dad's not there, mom's not there, dad's doing drugs, mom's doing drugs. And so these kids are basically just growing up by themselves. So there's lots of things happening to these younger people and we're trying to figure that out. So when it comes to raising a kid, this is what I believe, okay? Some of you guys might be a little bit different, but I totally believe it takes a village to raise a child. I would like to think that I'm a good parent that can just do a phenomenal job. But the reality is, 
We live in a global society where everything's so interconnected. And because everything is so interconnected, we all have a hand in what's happening in the lives of the young people in our community. So it's because of this, I still think, yes, it takes a whole village to raise a child, but at the start of that, it is the responsibility of us, the parents, to raise our kids so that they will be upright, good citizens in this country. It's going to take parents to start steering their kids in the right direction. And notice how I have the word parents. That means two, okay? It's going to take mom and dad to really take care of this kid. Can you do it by yourself? You can, but it's not ideal. Remember last week we talked about God creating the institution of a marriage? That's a husband and a wife both taking care of these kids. And so it's going to take both mom and dad in order to raise these great kids. Because if there's a divorce, here's some really scary statistics about what divorce does to kids and how that affects them. So three statistics on how divorce affects children. Number one, Following a divorce, children from divorced families are 50% more likely to develop health problems than non-divorced families. Like, the emotional toll of this for any person, it starts to rear its ugly head in physical ways. The emotional starts to affect the physical. And because of this, our bodies are affected because of that. Teenagers in single-parent families and in blended families are 300% more likely to need psychological help within any given year than teens from intact nuclear families. If mom and dad help raise you together, chances are, as far as your mental health concern, it's not as bad as your classmates, whereby maybe mom is the only one, dad's the only one, or it's stepmom, stepdad, okay? And then studies from the early 1980s demonstrated that children in situations where their parents have been involved in multiple divorces earned lower grades than their peers, and their peers rated them as less pleasant to be around. So when you take a look at the academics, of any kid. There's a really good correlation that the students who tend to do better, mom and dad, are still together. And the kids who've got the lower grades, that it's families that have been broken up. So because of this, I believe that every child needs both parents to be present in their life in order for them to live a robust, healthy life. In Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9 to 12, okay, different Bibles, they kind of, uh, they title this a little bit different. But in one of the Bibles, it's titled, Friends and Family Give Strength. And it says, Two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. So think about your kids. If you have a kid, you and your spouse, tackling your marriage together, helping your kids, that is going to be way much more better than you ever doing it by yourself or them ever doing it by themselves. That's not ideal. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But when someone who falls alone, okay, falls alone, they're in real trouble. It's really hard at any house for just a single parent to raise that. The more hands that you have, the better it's going to be. Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm, 
but how can one be warmed alone? I don't know if you guys could ever tell this. I could definitely tell this when I was growing up. But when it was just my father in the house and my mom was somewhere, the house was a little bit more cold. It wasn't as complete. Whenever it was just my mom home and my dad was somewhere else, the house wasn't as warm. It wasn't as complete. But when both sets of parents are there, there's a warmness in the house. And that just feels really, really good. But how can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. So, the more people that you have in your life invested in your kid, the stronger that rope is going to be. The way that I like to look at this is yes, I have six kids, but I also hope that when I come here, my six kids become your six kids. And if you have one kid or two kid or three kid or whatever, that when we come here, it is also my responsibility to also be a parent to your kid. Because we all need help raising these kids together. You cannot do it alone. And what better way than to be able to come where there is love in all the believers to be able to help raise these kids. So the way that I like to look at this, in a very, very healthy family, you have mom at one side of the triangle, you have dad at the other side of the triangle, and the head of the triangle is God. And here's the awesome part, and when that happens, everything in your child's life is going to be a lot more complete because they've got mom, they've got dad, and they've got God. I can tell you, if you take out one of these persons, okay, that child will still continue to grow, but it's just not as healthy as it is when you've got all three persons in there. And if you especially take that out, that's a scary place to be in. And the sad thing is our world today is telling us that we don't need God. You don't need God in the family. You don't need God at school. You don't need God in the government. It's really, really scary. But if you want your kids to grow up healthy and strong, you need three of these persons in their life. It was God's best plan to have both mom and dad raise their children together. So, if you're thinking about getting married, I hope to you that when you make that vow, till death do us part, that you're going to commit to loving you, and if you're going to have any kids, that you're going to commit to loving them forever together. That's really important, is that we need to stick together as a family, okay? All right, so I think I made the point. For any child to grow up, they need mom, they need dad, and they need God to be in their life. So then beyond that, what else do they need? We've been talking about it. We've been talking about this all morning time. The Reverend Jesse Jackson, he said, your children need your presence more than they need your presence. And I think that when we think about this, as a parent, I think we're all guilty of this at one point or the other, where we think that we can simply substitute time with our kids by just giving them something. But I want us to be reminded 
That's not what your kids want. They don't want your things that you're giving to them. They just want that most important thing that they will remember when they're older. It's your time. When your children get older, they will not remember the material things that you bought them, but they will remember the times and the memories that you made with them. All of us here this morning, when we were able to just articulate all these things that we remember, it's another testament to all of us to say, yeah, the greatest times that we treasured in our childhood, it wasn't the toys, it wasn't the gifts, but it's the memories. And those memories are the things that we continue to hold on to. Toys will break, toys will malfunction, they will go bad. But those memories that we have of our parents doing those things with us, it will never get damaged like that. So what are the memories that you're creating today with your kids so that they will be able to remember these things? Presents will come and go, but memories will last a lifetime. So we can try to give them all these little trinklets, all these little toys, all these little gifts. We can do that, or we can save that money, and we can put it into these bigger memories that they're going to remember for the rest of their life. Don't think that you can buy your children's love. They don't need your things. They just need your time, okay? So, this is really important for us to think about. What is your schedule like with your kids? Are you helping to build the memories today that will last a lifetime? Because it's really, really simple. If you want your children to turn out well, spend twice as much time with them and half as much money. I... So I meet with quite a few families here at the church. And I know that some individuals struggle with this concept of loving their kids. They work too much. They play too much. They're doing other things. They're not physically present in their, their kids' lives. So as a way to make up for that, they think that they can buy their child's love. But I want us to know and remember, that's not what your kids are wanting. They just want your time that you can spend with them so that you can show them that you love them, not give them your love. So this used to be my schedule. So this is me trying to help you. And maybe you can also help me, okay? So it's really difficult right now, working two full-time jobs, working for DC Everest Monday through Friday, and then basically working for the church Saturday through Sunday full-time. So my schedule basically looks like this. Can anybody else also maybe raise your hand and be like, yep, Pastor Yao? Same thing, right here. Okay, all right. So, I realize that my kids are not getting any younger. I realize that the more that I've worked, the more that I'm neglecting to build a relationship with my kids. And that is time that I will never get back. And so I had to do a lot of soul searching. And so I really had to say to myself, yeah, what are you doing with your time? Because there are six kids that need their father too. I think that sometimes we get so busy doing everything else for everybody and the people that we neglect most are the ones that we should be loving the most. We've said this a lot of times. 
Sometimes the people that we love the most, sometimes the people that we should be spending the most time with, we spend the least time with. And so I looked at my schedule and I didn't like it. There was no time for me to spend with my kids. So basically, I just had to say, from now on out, Friday nights are what I call Friday family nights. This is the one night out of the entire week where I do not touch anything related to work. I do not touch anything related to the church. I have to be intentional while carving out that time and just saying, this is my time with my kids because my kids need my time as well. So when that happens, okay, like we were able to go snowshoeing on Friday. When I'm intentional about carving out time with my kids, we can go on little trips up north. And when that happens, it's as simple as just staying home, watching a nice Netflix kid movie together, or just playing a board game. And so, I do that once a week. Think about your schedule. Are you making it an intentional time for you to spend with your child or your children so that they know that during that time, you have their full attention. So it's never too late. You guys might be thinking, but Pastor Yao, I've blown it. I'm 50, I'm 60, I'm 70. My kids are older. I can tell you, even as a 37 year old, I enjoy every moment that I can spend with my parents. So this is the redemption in all of this. Your child is still there. Yes, they might be more grown up now, but it's never too late for you to still spend time, intentional time, with your kid. They're never too old for your time. So let's go back to that school shooting. Could this school shooting tragedy have been prevented? I really believe so, okay? And the reason why I say this is because every child is one caring adult away from being a success story. Maybe Nicholas wouldn't have done that thing if maybe just one adult cared to come to him and say, hey, I noticed that your mom died last year. I noticed that your dad's been dead for a long time. I noticed that you're just living with some people that you know of. I really believe that with some of these kids in our community, they're just looking for one adult positive relationship. And if that's your child, that can be you. But I think we need to have the heart in our community to also realize that there are other children in our community. Their families might be a little bit more dysfunctional. So how can you as a mom be a mom to them how can you as a dad be a dad to them? Because maybe if we start establishing these relationships of care and trust, maybe we can start steering these kids away from some of these tragedies that they want to do up here and they carry through with that. Nicholas Cruz's parents have not been in his life for a while now because they've been dead. How many families are still out there where their parents are still alive but they might as well be gone because they're just way too busy with everything else. So yes, we get that. Nicholas' parents, they were physically gone. But how many times can we also be very guilty that we were physically present in our kid's life, but emotionally, we were somewhere else. And so our physical and our emotional for our kids, that needs to be connected together. Not only do we need to be physically there for them, but we need to also be emotionally there for our kids. That's what they want for us. That's what they need. 
So here's a sad story. So for eight years, I taught at the middle school. And you know the coolest thing about being a teacher was? Each and every day, for five days straight, I get to develop a really, really personal relationship with 130 students every day. Every day, I got to hang out with these kids for 50 minutes every day. One day, there was a student. I loved her. Her name was Michaela. She came through the door. She always, she always had a smile on her face. And one day, she came in the door. She goes, hey, Dad. And then she caught herself. You see, I'm supposed to be called Mr. Yang. But after a while, you develop such a great personal relationship of just trust with these students that sometimes they don't even see you as just being their teacher. They see you as being a father to them. That's powerful. Michaela apologized. She said, Mr. Yang, I'm sorry for calling you dad. And I said, Michaela, don't be sorry. It's okay. I get that because some of these kids, they don't have a dad. And so you are their only dad. And so Michaela said this to me, and this is something that I will never forget. She goes, Mr. Yang, I'm sorry for calling you dad, but the truth is I get to hang out with you and I get to talk with you for 45 minutes every day. When I go home, my father's there, but we maybe just talk for one or two sentences and that's it. You see, this is what's happening in the, the homes of America today. Yes, we're all kind of together, maybe, but we're not together in here. And our kids need our heart. Because if your kid does not have you know, your heart, your child is going to find, they're going to go and find love from that other boyfriend, that other girlfriend, that other person that's bad for them, or another substance that's going to help them drown themselves out from the misery that they're experiencing. So we truly need to be fathers and mothers to our kids. That's what they want from us. In Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6, today's Bible verse, it says, direct your, uh, direct your children onto the right path, and when they are older, they will not leave it. I promise you that if you spend time with your kids, and if you talk to them, you will be able to train your child the way that they're supposed to be raised, the way that they're supposed to live their life, the way that Jesus wants them to walk their life. And so if you want to love your kids, spend time with them, and when you do spend those times with them, you don't have to throw the Bible at them, but you can have these conversations to start staring at them in these different ways of how they're supposed to live their life as a little Christian daughter, as a little Christian son. That's how we raise our children to come to know Jesus, is by spending those small, little, intimate times with them. Show your love by showing your time. That's all that these kids ask of us. That's all that they want. So this is what I believe. I believe that a family that prays together stays together. This might be a pretty painful question for me to ask all of you. When was the last time your family got together to pray together? If that's been a very long time, I would implore you today to think about that. 
What can I start doing now to have my family come to pray together? Because I honestly believe that a family that prays together stays together. Having said that, if you think that you haven't been the best father, if you think that you haven't been the best mother, okay, I want you to know that I do believe that your kids might have a more positive perception of you as a parent. Sometimes as a father, I think, help me, father, to be a better husband, a better father, and a better, better servant. We feel like as parents, sometimes we're, we're failing our kids. We haven't done a good enough job. But sometimes our kids think otherwise. I pray that I can grow up to be just like my daddy. So I do believe that all of you are doing good. But there are things that we can be doing better. Sometimes as a mom, you might think, help me to be a better wife, a mother, and a servant because you just feel like you haven't been the best mother. But I want to encourage you this. Your kids might think, I pray that I grew up to be just like my mom. So because of this, I want you guys to know that we could always be doing better but at least we keep on trying. So here's the deal. If you want your kids to have confidence, if you want them to feel safe, if you want them to have positive self-esteem, that is not going to come through a gift. It is going to come through you spending time with your kids. In fact, research has actually shown us, especially as fathers, if we spend time wrestling with our kids, that actually helps our kids to grow up and be better. So when I was growing up, I was involved in athletics. And I don't really remember my parents really being there for most of my athletic things. And that was really, really sad. Because during my eighth grade year, I took second place at the city meet. That was my best, greatest achievement in cross country. But my father and my mother were not there. I've never had a sit down conversation and, and talk to them about these things. Sometimes I think it's a little bit painful, but it's because I remember the pain of crossing that finish line, doing such an awesome job but not seeing anybody there from your family to just be cheering you on, to be so proud of you. That hurt. And so now as a parent of six kids, I don't ever wish for my kids to ever feel that loneliness, that abandonment, that lack of support that I felt. And so as much as I can now, I try to be a, the best father that I can. That's Kennedy's soccer team that I coached. You will be your child's greatest hero by just simply being there for them. If you want to be super dad, just be super present. That's all it takes. It doesn't require you to read a dummy's guide to being a good parent book. You don't even have to do that. You don't even need to go and see the professional counselor. How can I be a great parent? You will be your child's greatest hero by just simply being there for them. When they look to the sideline, they just want to see that you are there cheering them on. That's all that it takes. Not your gifts, just your time. Your kids need two simple words from you, okay? Be there. When your kids are going to be playing sports, you can just say, I will be there. When your kids are doing things, you can just be like, 
I will be there to help you. So to all the fathers out there, this is a word of encouragement for you. I believe that a father should be a son's first hero and a daughter's first love. So fathers, are you your son's superhero? Because all you have to do is just be there for them. That's all of that takes. Unfortunately, Brother Rocky is not here today. He doesn't have any kids. I know that there's some of us in this room that we don't have any kids. But again, my word of encouragement to you is, my kids are your kids. So when I can't be there, I need you to be a father to my kids. And when you're not there, and I'm with your kid, I want to be a father to your kid. It takes an entire church to be able to raise up Christ's obedient children. We all need to do this together. This is my word of encouragement to some of your families that have a prodigal daughter or a prodigal son. All these examples that I've talked about, it's really simple. When you've got little kids, because if they tell, if you tell them, you're going to go with me, these kids have to go with you. But I know that some of you guys have adult kids now that might be a little bit more on the defiant end of things. And so my word of encouragement to you is look at the prodigal son. The prodigal son ran away from his father. But the father always said, son, I'm not going anywhere. I will always be here. My time I will always have for you. When you come back to me, I will still love you. I will still give you all of the time in the world. And so we need to learn that lesson from him. Because God is the greatest father. Okay? Don't give up. I'm still working in you. If God is not giving up on us, if God the Father is still working in us and we're his kids, we have run away from God many, many times. But God is still giving us time. So if your son, if your daughter, if they are that prodigal person, Think about what our Father gives us. Just patience and time. And so we need to continue to just show them that time. We're not going anywhere. When they come back, we will still give them our time. So the greatest Father, who was this? It was God. And the reason why, okay, is because when Jesus needed his Father, his father was there for them. When Jesus was born, Jesus could have been killed. But his father gave him the time. His father helped him. Jesus did not die with the 300. When Jesus was being tempted by the devil, when he reached out, God was there for him. God had the time for Jesus. And when Jesus was on the cross, nailed to the cross, God was there with them. God gave Jesus time. So I want you guys to know that your sin is not greater than the blood of Jesus. You see, Jesus died on the cross. His blood is good enough to wash away all of our sins. And thank goodness that God our Father was there for Jesus. That in the moment of crucifixion, Jesus still knew that his Father was there for him. So Jesus was able to go through that. Thank goodness. Because our sins can be washed away with his blood. Because when Jesus needed God the most, God was there for him. 
I want to end it today kind of by sharing this story. Some of you guys might have heard it, but I think it's another good reality check. And so a son said to his father, hey, Daddy, can I just ask you one simple question? And his father says, yes, what is it that you want? And so his son said, how much did you make an hour, Dad? And his dad says, well, that's none of your business. Why do you ask such a thing? And so his son just said, well, I just want to know, Dad. Please tell me, how much do you make an hour? So his dad says, well, if you must know, I make $100 an hour. And so the son said, so daddy, may I borrow $50 from you? The father was furious and said, if the only reason you ask that is so that you can borrow some money to buy a silly toy or some other nonsense, then you march yourself straight into your room and you go on to bed. Think about you and how silly and selfish you're thinking. I work very hard every day for my money. And so, sheepishly, the little boy quietly went to his room and he shut the door. The man sat down and started to even become more angry about the boy's question. He thought, how dear my son ask questions only so that he can get my money. So after about an hour or so, the man had finally calmed himself down and he started to think, hmm, maybe there was really something that he needed to buy with that $50. And he really didn't ask for money very often, so I guess that might be okay. So then the father went to the door of the little boy's room and he opened the door and he asked his son if he was awake and the little boy replied that he was. So then the dad said, you know, I've been thinking about, you know, what happened and I think I was too hard on you earlier. It's been a long day and I became very aggravated with you. So here's the $50 that you were wanting. So with that, the little boy, he, he sat straight up, smiling, and he says, Oh, thank you, Daddy. Yeah. Then reaching under his pillow, the boy pulled out some crumpled up bills. The father saw that the boy had already had some money, and so then he again started to get angry. And as the little boy slowly counted his money, his father asked, Why do you want more money if you've already got some? And so with that, his son replied, because I didn't have enough, but now I do. Daddy, I have $100 now. Can I buy an hour of your time? Please come home early tomorrow. I just want to have dinner with you for one hour. The father was crushed. He put his arms around his little son and he begged his son for forgiveness. It's kind of interesting how we have different priorities in our life. Like they say, don't forget the reason why you're earning the money in the first place. Time is the most precious commodity that you can give to those that are closest to you. So what are we going to do based on this sermon? How can we start applying some of these truths into our life? We need to start changing who we are as parents. Okay? I want you to think about this question. I want you guys to pray about this question. How can you carve out more time in your life for your kids? <clears throat> Nobody on their deathbed is ever going to have regrets. Oh, I wish I could have worked more. But on our deathbed, we're all going to regret. I wish I would have spent more time with my family, with my kids. Guess what? God's mercy he is giving to us. We have life today. You still can redeem yourself. What can you start doing today to spend more time with your kids? I want you guys to think about that. I want you guys to reflect and pray about that for one minute, please.
So here at the end, this is the reason why today's sermon question is, how do I love my children? And it's so simple, and it's free. Love your children by giving them your time. That's all that they want from you. That's the reason why today's sermon title is Presence, Not Presence. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, oh, thank you so much for being here with us today. And Lord, it's the month of love. It's February, and sometimes we think about, you know, like, our significant other, our spouse, our husband, our wife. But Lord God, we often neglect to love our kids. And Lord God, I just ask that today's sermon would just convict the heart of every parent here today so that, Lord God, we can stop blowing our money on material gifts and presents to our kids. But Lord God, we can start blessing our kids with our presence. Lord, help us to look at our schedule. Help us to be able to change our schedule so that, Lord God, we can spend more time with our kids. So like your words tell us, so that we can start training them to be able to walk in the way of the Lord. And we pray all these things in Jesus Christ's name, amen. And here at the end, our uh, song that we're going to sing together, it is As For Me and My House. As for me.